I'm Sana Safi, and this is Project 17. In 2015, the United Nations announced a radical plan to change the world. Global leaders agreed on 17 sustainable development goals, a blueprint for a better future, covering everything from improving health and gender equality to tackling climate change. The BBC World Service asked 17-year-olds from 17 different countries to investigate whether the goals are likely to be met where they are. This week, the United Nations is holding its Youth Summit in New York, and today I'm joined by some of the Project 17 teenagers for an online discussion with the United Nations Deputy Secretary General and Chair of its SDG Group. Amina Mohammed. Before the COVID-19 lockdown started, Yolanda Nazar made a Project 17 program about her rural school in, in Eastern Cape, South Africa. Yolanda, what are the main problems with your school? Well, I will first start with safety. We don't have safety school yet. Secondly, we have a shortage of teachers. Uh, if I can make an example now, we're about to write um, much exams, but other children don't have physics teacher, and physics teacher is a major subject here in South Africa. So we have those kind of problems, shortage of teachers, textbook, sanitation, schoolyard. Yolanda, do you have anything else in mind that you'd like to share with Amina Mohammed? Well, I, I would like to say, um, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't even trust our government to meet the SDG goals here in South Africa because we have a lot of corruption. And when it comes to education, who are the last people that they care about? So I don't have any hope that the government is going to meet the SDG goals because uh, they don't care. I will lie, they don't care because if they say education is the key to success, but they even they don't even put an effort to make that dream come true for ourselves. Look, here in South Africa, we have many bachelors from last year's students, but they haven't get schools yet. They don't have accommodation. They don't school. They don't have school funds. We're very struggling. So I just I don't have any hope. To, I will just wait and see. Thank you, Yolanda. Well, you know, um, y- Yolanda, I think, <clears throat> I think you must always have hope because life in itself is a journey of trying to achieve day by day your aspirations. You never give up. Um, that's why, you know, for us, we, we believe this intergenerational transition from us to you, you will do better because you've got more tools, you are better connected and you can make things happen. Um, However, you are absolutely right that the social contract between government and people has been eroded. And in many countries, young people are completely disappointed with the governance and with the way in which um, governments are delivering on basic services. This is not even more than your rights to education, to health. Um, So, you know, we continue, the SG, uh, the Secretary General continues to amplify those voices. What I hear today from you, I take into different fora. Um, where we will tackle governments to say, look, this is what the people are saying. Young people have told me that they don't believe that they have a future. And this is really serious because without hope, um, then, you know, all else is lost. So keep that hope alive and the energy that you have and the aspirations um, and keep keep fire under our feet. Keep fire under the feet of the public service of governments to, to do the right thing. Several of the sustainable development goals are closely linked to global warming. I don't know any teenagers who aren't worried about global warming and the environment. Hereti Fire lives on the Cook Islands in the Pacific, and she made a Project 17 program that looks at the effect of climate change on life underwater. It's Sustainable Development Goal number 14. Her program will be on air in a few weeks' time. Island nations are suffering the effects of global warming now. It's already changing people's lives. It is the middle of the night on the Cook Islands at the moment, so Hureti recorded her question for us. Hello, my name is Hureti Pao. I'm from the Cook Islands and I live on, live on the island of Rabatonga. For a small Pacific island nation such as us, sea levels rising means that we lose our outer islands, we lose land and people are displaced in our country. 
ocean acidification means the coral that protect us from tidal waves and cyclones and the full force of the sea are being degraded and lost, which leaves us vulnerable. My question to you today is, what is being done to make sure that countries who have a large carbon footprint, one that is thousands of times bigger than ours, what is being done to help them or make them reduce carbon dioxide emissions? Um, well, great question. And if it wasn't really for the, the huge dilemmas that we see, c climate catastrophe after the other with the small um, island developing states, the alarm bell would not have been sounded. The Secretary General's call has been, first of all, to get those emissions, um, a commitment to, to governments with plans um, to, to get to 2050 with the reductions in emissions that give us a planet that we can live on, on 1.5 degrees um, Celsius. But it's also about what they're going to do between now and 2030 in order to make that 2050 um, target right so that sea levels will not continue to lie, rise um, and acidification will hopefully be on the reverse. Um, so far, we have just about, I think, 65% commitment. We have the rest of this year to go to get 100% commitment. Um, and we need resources also to go to small island developing states for adaptation and resilience. Um, and we're asking all the multilateral development banks to have 50% of their financing on climate to go to small island developing states and other countries too um, on adaptation. So there's a big push and what I would really urge you to do is to keep amplifying and keep them loud, keep the pressure up, keep the protests up to make sure that we get um, to 1.5 degrees. Amina Mohammed, you have said in the past that sustainable development goal number five Gender equality connects to all other SDGs. Why? We just talked about education now, and we know that girls were not getting equal access to education. Now we've done well in, in basic education moving to secondary, but we've seen a lot of dropouts uh, for, for many, many economic reasons. Um, same thing for health. Um, do we see women able to go into a hospital full of joy uh, to give birth and to come out alive? The mortality rates were very high. And so therefore this is about gender and that goal is important to health. It's important to equality. Do we have equal access uh, to decision-making roles, to leadership um, beyond just education and, and health, um, but in every uh, facet of life? Um, and, and that is, is not on the increase. Um, when we talk about affordable and clean energy, we know that women bear the brunt of having to, to work with um, you know, firewood and coal um, in, in order to feed their families and into some places keep warm because, because, because of the weather. So how do we move to renewable energy uh, so that women are freed up, they're healthier um, and they can do the work, water and sanitation. Each goal has a huge gender component to it because 50% of this population is women and girls and they've never had uh, the opportunity to be recognized um, uh, for the value that they have um, in, in ensuring that we have, you know, a fair and just world. Sahar Baik's program for Project 17 examined violence against women in India, where it's a very live issue. Sahar spoke to a survivor of domestic violence and to a male politician who seemed to be taking a very traditional view about women and girls and their place in society. Sahar, tell us a bit about the program you made about gender equality in India. Uh, it was really, um, it was hard and also heartening at the same time because I, while I was talking to the politician, while I'm very aware of what are, uh, what are some of the loudest people in our government sound like, um, it was really difficult to hear it. And um, yet talking to my friends, talking to um, Shalinta, who is a survivor of domestic violence, I also talked to um, two young girls who uh, are doing grassroots work in their own communities. And um, all of that really inspired me and really um, uh, strengthened my resolve that um, things are changing. Sahar, what would you like to ask Amina Mohammed? Um, yeah, I, it's really heartening now to hear you talk about how gender equality is tied to every goal because that is what I believe as well. And it's, 
Um, lovely to hear you say that. But also, I wanted to ask that after the effects of the pandemic, we saw um, uh, the setback that it gave us. And what is the UN's renewed strategy to establish gender equality bit by bit? Well, I mean, first and foremost, gender equality has to be um, at the very beginning of any policy or plan that we uh, design or co-create, that we are seeing that what we would like from every investment we make in education, in the economy, in environment, that the results come out in the lives of people, 50% of which are women and girls. And so it's very much about seeing you from the very beginning all the way through to success means that you are um, attended to, that your impact in your life happens. And, and that's not always so because you're not at the table when those designs uh, are sometimes being made. And certainly the measures for success don't include the impact in women's lives. So I think a real understanding that we are mainstreaming, that it is not um, charity, it is not an add-on that you put women into the mix, um, uh, that it should be there right from the very beginning. So socializing that in policy making and planning um, as we do it. In terms of investments, really putting an emphasis on um, in, uh, uh, the implications of not investing um, in women, showing people um, how uh, that in fact rolls back development and that we won't reach the, the, the 2030 goals if those investments are not made in women. You mentioned an incredibly important um, uh, uh, issue of gender-based violence, which has in fact increased since we've had COVID. In many cases, women who have been incarcerated in the lockdown in their homes are the perpetrator of that violence. Um, and, so, and so it's really important the laws are in place. But ultimately, gender-based violence, it happens in the home. So cultures, societies, communities need to say zero. Men and women, need, men and boys need to say zero. Watching it, you are complicit. Um, and understanding just the value of a woman and to raise a hand against a woman um, or a girl um, is a sign of cowardice. It's a sign of weakness. Um, it is an abuse of a fundamental right to live um, without fear. Um, and so I think these things are what you as young people, um, this intergenerational transition needs to be about you, men and women, girls and boys, um, are standing up to say the future for us is one without violence against women. Um, and then to work towards all the building blocks and, and the protections that need to be put in place to ensure it doesn't happen. Sahar, do you have any other questions for Amina? Yeah, that was um, related to what you just said about um, violence against women, which uh, we saw a spike with the pandemic. And for the first time, I got uh, really close to it because uh, someone living close to us um, had to be taken to the hospital and um, her sort of medical bills and her health was um, taken care of by my parents. And if for the first time in my life, I really witnessed it. Um, and it became very real for me. And I talked to uh, a survivor of abuse and she is thriving now. She's, uh, but uh, her story was really powerful. And I wanted to ask you, like you said, it's a cultural, um, it's embedded in our culture. So how do we make a breakthrough in cultural mindsets that normalizes this, that um, says every day that it is okay that this happens and that um, it is almost a right that if a man is married to a woman, he can do whatever he wants. So we do have responsibilities as men and, and women, mothers and fathers, uh, to inculcate those zero uh, tolerance levels for violence against um, our young girls and as they become women. And then you go into the community. As you get older, there are custodians of our cultures and of our values, and they need to be spoken to so that they understand that they've got an obligation and they have accountability, whether it's to their God or their custom, to ensure that there isn't a violent community. And that violence includes when you raise a hand against a woman. It's not right. Um, and so we, they, they also have to be champions of that. Um, and then of course, government, I always will tell you that government is, um, is the last space because by the time you need government to come in and respond with a law, that woman has already been harmed. That girl has already been harmed. So it's a recourse to justice, which we must have, but let's prevent it to begin with. Let's say that that law should not exist because we have societies where we take care of our women and our girls. And, um, 
And so it, it, it is, as I said, it's, a, it's everyone. It's an all of society um, response. Um, and I do think it's a pandemic now. I think it is an emergency that every government has to stand up and say to their communities and their people, how do we put a stop to this? This is not what we want to be recognized at as a country that says it's okay um, to be violent against its, its, uh, its women and its girls. Thank you, Amina, and thank you, Sahar, for those great questions. Now, the first of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals, number one on the list, is to eradicate poverty. Lanray Adelaide made a program here in the UK where child poverty is a big issue and only seems to be getting worse. Lanray, can you tell us a bit about your program? Yeah. So my program was about um, poverty uh, in the UK and how, why is poverty happening in such a rich country like the UK being like the sixth largest economy. And we spoke to quite a few people. And I think one that stood out to me is when I spoke to a head teacher about um how poverty affects his school and you know all of the work that he does um to kind of make sure that like loads of his kids aren't left without food in holidays in during the school day and um throughout the year um and you know talking to him just made me think um why can't like the government come up with a scheme that is New, like that is the same throughout across the board because not everyone's as lucky to be at that school and then we also spoke to other people in in Leeds about their experiences. Lanry what do you think is the UK getting able to meet the sustainable development goal of eradicating poverty by 2030? Uh, I've said it once I'll say it again I, I don't think they will. Sana, I want to ask Landre, what are you going to do about it? Will you accept that they cannot reach it? What are you going to do about it as a young person? I feel um, one of the things I do, like, obviously, um, I'm a member of Youth Parliament in um, in the UK, and I'm also part of this um, organisation called Bite Back, uh, and they kind of um, campaign on stuff like um, food poverty, uh, free school meals, like you mentioned. Uh, so... I'm not, I'm not, I know I'm here just like saying, um, I know it's not going to happen, um, that they're not going to meet the goals. But outside of everything I'm doing, I do feel, um, along with other pe- young people um, in my network, we're trying to get um, the government to listen. We're trying to um, get um, big players. Because um, something we've said is that if we want um, people to, if we want the government to listen, we've got to get those influential figures to make them listen up. I think that's brilliant. So you're doing a huge amount um, and that needs to grow, grow your movement from the few that you are to the many that you need to be to make government and people like us listen and to take much more um, attention to it. Um, People always ask me if the goals will be achieved. And my answer to them is I'm not going to fail before I get there. So I'm going to do my damnedest to make sure that those goals are achieved by 2030. And when I get to 2030 and I haven't made it, okay, I'm going to stretch out the next 15 years and put another set of goals. But I'm never giving up on humanity um, and what it need, what we need to do to work to close the gap between what is a reality, which is miserable sometimes, but what is an aspiration, which is incredibly beautiful. And the gap in some countries is smaller and the gap in other countries is huge. My job to try to close that gap with every day that I'm here at the helm of affairs. And I hope that you'll all join us in in trying to do that in the ways that you do um, and that you can create the movements and the noise that we need to have, um, uh, you know, really to make governments sit up and and do what they're supposed to do. But I I thank you for being, you know, as courageous and as uh, forthright as as you all are. It's, It's amazing. It's great. Thank you to everyone. And thank you to the UN's Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed for taking the time to engage with Project 17's young reporters. And thank you to Yolanda Nazo, Zahar Beek, Hereti File, and Lanray Adley for all the energy and enthusiasm you have put into these programs. I'm Sana Safi, and you have been listening to a special edition of Project 17 from the BBC World Service. If you'd like to listen to any of the editions mentioned above, Um, about the different sustainable development goals, just search online for BBC Project 17. Thank you, everyone.